Chapter Fourteen of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Joan's opportunity for watching Kells and his men and overhearing their colloquies was as good as it had been back in Cabin Gulch, but it developed that where Kells had been open and frank, he now became secret and cautious. She was aware that men, singly and in couples, visited him during the early hours of the night, and they had conferences in low, earnest tones. She could peer out of her little window and see dark, silent forms come up from the ravine at the back of the cabin and leave the same way. None of them went round to the front door, where Batewood smoked and kept guard. Joan was able to hear only scraps of these earnest talks, and from part of one she gathered that for some reason or other Kells desired to bring himself into notice. Alder Creek must be made to know that a man of importance had arrived. It seemed to Joan that this was the very last thing which Kells ought to do. What magnificent daring the bandit had! Famous years before in California, with a price set upon his life in Nevada, and now the noted, if unknown, leader of border robbers in Idaho. He sought to make himself prominent, respected, and powerful. Joan found that in spite of her horror at the sinister and deadly nature of the bandit's enterprise, she could not avoid an absorbing interest in his fortunes. Next day Joan watched for an opportunity to tell Jim Cleve that he might come to her little window any time after dark to talk and plan with her. No chance presented itself. Joan wore the dress she had made, to the evident pleasure of Batewood and Pierce. They had conceived as strong an interest in her fortunes as she had in Kells's. Wood nodded his approval, and Pierce said she was a lady once more. Strange it was to Joan that this villain Pierce, whom she could not have dared trust, grew open in his insinuating hints of Kells's blackguardism. Strange, because Pierce was absolutely sincere. When Jim Cleve did see Joan in her dress the first time, he appeared so glad and relieved and grateful that she feared he might betray himself. So she got out of his sight. Not long after that, Kells called her from her room. He wore a somber and thoughtful cast of countenance. Red Pierce and Jesse Smith were standing at attention. Cleve was sitting on the threshold of the door, and Wood leaned against the wall. "'Is there anything in the pack of stuff I bought you that you could use for a veil?' asked Kells of Joan. "'Yes,' she replied. "'Get it,' he ordered. "'And your hat, too.' Joan went to her room and returned with the designated articles, the hat being that which she had worn when she left Hodley. "'That'll do. Put it on, over your face, and let's see how you look.' Joan complied with this request, all the time wondering what Kells meant. "'I wanted to disguise you, but not to hide your youth. Your good looks,' he said, and he arranged it differently about her face. There. You'd sure make any man curious to see you now. Put on the hat. Joan did so. Then Kells appeared to become more forcible. You're to go down into the town. Walk slow as far as the last nugget. Cross the road and come back. Look at every man you meet or see standing by. Don't be in the least frightened. Pierce and Smith will be right behind you. They'd get to you before anything could happen. Do you understand? Yes, replied Joan. Red Pierce stirred uneasily. Jack, I'm thinking some rough talk will come her way, he said darkly. We've shut up, replied Kells in quick passion. He resented some implication. I've thought of that. She won't hear what's said to her. Here, and he turned again to Joan. Take some cotton or anything and stuff up your ears. Make a good job of it. Joan went back to her room and, looking about for something with which to execute Kells's last order, she stripped some soft, woolly bits from a fleece-lined piece of cloth. 
With these she essayed to deaden her hearing. Then she returned. Kell spoke to her, but though she seemed dully to hear his voice, she could not distinguish what he said. She shook her head. With that, Kells waved her out upon her strange errand. Joan brushed against Cleve as she crossed the threshold. What would he think of this? She would not see his face. When she reached the first tense, she could not resist the desire to look back. Pierce was within twenty yards of her, and Smith about the same distance farther back. Joan was more curious than anything else. She divined that Kells wanted her to attract attention, but for what reason she was at a loss to say. It was significant that he did not intend to let her suffer any indignity while fulfilling this mysterious mission. Not until Joan got well down the road toward the last nugget did anyone pay any attention to her. A Mexican jabbered at her, showing his white teeth flashing his slow black eyes. Young miners eyed her curiously, and some of them spoke. She met all kinds of men along the plank walk, most of whom passed by, apparently unobserving. She obeyed Kells to the letter. But for some reason, she was unable to explain, when she got to the row of saloons where lounging, evil-eyed rowdies accosted her, she found she had to disobey him, at least in one particular. She walked faster. Still, that did not make her task much easier. It began to be an ordeal. The farther she got, the bolder men grew. Could it have been that Kells wanted this sort of thing to happen to her? Joan had no idea what these men meant, but she believed that was because for the time being she was deaf. Assuredly, their looks were not a compliment to any girl. Joan wanted to hurry now, and she had to force herself to walk at a reasonable gait. One persistent fellow walked beside her for several steps. Joan was not fool enough not to realize now that these wayfarers wanted to make her acquaintance, and she decided she would have something to say to Kells when she got back. Below the last nugget she crossed the road and started upon the return trip. In front of this gambling hell, there were scattered groups of men, standing and going in. A tall man, in black, detached himself and started out as if to intercept her. He wore a long black coat, a black bow tie, and a black sombrero. He had little, hard, piercing eyes, as black as his dress. He wore gloves and looked immaculate compared with the other men. He, too, spoke to Joan turned to walk with her. She looked straight ahead now, frightened, and she wanted to run. He kept beside her, apparently talking. Joan heard only the low sound of his voice. Then he took her arm, gently but with familiarity. Joan broke from him and quickened her pace. Say there, leave that girl alone. This must have been yelled, for Joan certainly heard it. She recognized Red Pierce's voice and she wheeled to look. Pierce had overhauled the gambler, and already men were approaching. Involuntarily, Joan halted. What would happen? The gambler spoke to Pierce, made what appeared deprecating gestures, as if to explain, but Pierce looked angry. I'll tell her daddy, he shouted. Joan waited for no more. She almost ran. There would surely be a fight, could that have been Kells's intention? Whatever it was, she had been subjected to a mortifying and embarrassing affront. She was angry, and she thought it might be just as well to pretend to be furious. Kells must not use her for his nefarious schemes. She hurried on, and, to her surprise, when she got in sight of the cabin, both Pierce and Smith had almost caught up with her. Jim Cleve sat where she had last seen him. Also, Kells was outside. The way he strode to and fro showed Joan his anxiety. There was more to this incident than she could phantom. She took the padding from her ears, to her intense relief. And, soon reaching the cabin, she tore off the veil and confronted Kells. "'Wasn't that a, a fine thing for you to do?' she demanded furiously. 
and with the outburst she felt her face blazing. If I'd any idea what you meant, you couldn't have driven me. I trusted you, and you sent me down there on some shameful errand of yours. You're no gentleman. Joan realized that her speech, especially the latter part, was absurd. But it had a remarkable effect upon Kells. His face actually turned red. He stammered something and halted, seemingly at a loss for words. How singularly the slightest hint of any act or word of hers that approached a possible respect or tolerance worked upon this bandit. He started toward Joan, appealingly, but she passed him in contempt and went to her room. She heard him cursing Pierce in a rage, evidently blaming his lieutenant for whatever had angered her. But you wanted her insulted, protested Pierce hotly. You mullethead, roared Kells. I wanted some man, any man, just to get near enough to her so I could swear she'd been insulted. You let her go through that camp to meet real insult. Why, Pierce, I've a mind to shoot you. Shoot, retorted Pierce. I obeyed your orders as I saw them. And I want to say right here that when it comes to anything concerning this girl, you're plumb off your nut. That's what. And you can like it or lump it. I've said it before. You'd split over this girl. And I say it now. Through the door, Joan had a glimpse of Cleve stepping between the angry men. This seemed unnecessary, however, for Pierce's stinging assertion had brought Kells to himself. There were few more words, too low for Joan's ears, and then, accompanied by Smith, the three started off, evidently for the camp. Joan left her room and watched them from the cabin door. Bate Wood sat outside, smoking. "'I'm declaring my hand,' he said to Joan, feelingly. "'I'd never have stood for that scurvy trick. "'Now, miss, this is the toughest camp I've ever seen. "'I mean tough as a women. "'For it ain't begun to fan guns and steal gold yet.' "'Why did Kells want me insulted?' asked Joan. "'Well, he's got to have a reason for raising an awful fuss,' replied Wood. "'Fuss?' Sure, replied Wood dryly. What for? So we can walk out on the stage, rejoined Wood evasively. It's mighty strange, said Joan. I reckon all about Mr. Kells is some strange these days. Red Pierce had it correct. Kells is going to split on you. What do you mean by that? Well, he'll go one way and the gang another. Why? asked Joan earnestly. Miss... There's some lot of reasons, said Wood deliberately. First, he did for Holloway and Bailey, not because they wanted to treat you as he meant to, but just because he wanted to be alone. We were all wise that you shot him, and that you wasn't his wife. And since then, we've seen him gradually lose his nerve. He organized his legion and made his plan to run this Alder Creek Red. He still hangs on to you, He'll kill any man that batted an eye at you. And through all this, because he's not Jack Kells of old, he's lost his pull with the gang. Sooner or later he'll split. Have I any real friends among you? asked Joan. Well, I reckon. Are you my friend, Batewood? she went on, in sweet wistfulness. The grizzled old bandit removed his pipe and looked at her with a glint in his bloodshot eyes. I sure am. I'll sneak you off now if you'll go. I'll stick a knife in Kells if you say so. Oh, no, I'm afraid to run off. And you needn't harm Kells. After all, he's good to me. Good to you? Why, he keeps you captive like an Indian would. When he's given me orders to watch you, keep you locked up? Wood's snort of disgust and wrath was thoroughly genuine. Still, Joan knew that she dared not trust him any more than Pierce or the others. Their raw emotions would undergo a change if Kells's possession of her were transferred to them. It occurred to Joan, however, that she might use Wood's friendliness to some advantage. So I'm going to be locked up, she asked. You're supposed to be. Without anyone to talk to? 
Well, you'll have me when you want, and I reckon that ain't much to look forward to. But I can tell you a heap of stories. And when Kells ain't around, if you're careful about to get me catched, you can do as you want. Thank you, Bate. I'm going to like you, replied Joan sincerely. And then she went back to her room. There was sewing to do, and while she worked, she thought, so that the hours sped. When the light got so poor that she could sew no longer, she put the work aside and stood at her little window, watching the sunset. From the front of the cabin came the sound of subdued voices. Probably Kells and his men had returned. She was sure of this when she heard the ring of Batewood's axe. All at once an object darker than the stones arrested Joan's gaze. There was a man sitting on the far side of the little ravine. Instantly she recognized Jim Cleve. He was looking at the little window, at her. Joan believed he was there for just that purpose. Making sure that no one else was near to see, she put out her hand and waved it. Jim gave a guarded, perceptible sign that he had observed her action, and almost directly got up and left. Joan needed no more than that to tell her how Jim's idea of communicating with her corresponded with her own. That night she would talk with him, and she was thrilled through. The secrecy, the peril, somehow, lent this prospect a sweetness, a zest, a delicious fear. Indeed, she was not only responding to love, but to daring, to defiance, to a wilder, nameless element, born of her environment and the needs of the hour. Presently, Bate Wood called her into supper. Pierce, Smith, and Cleve were finding seats at the table, but Kells looked rather sick. Joan observed him then more closely. His face was pale and damp, strangely shaded, as if there were something dark under the pale skin. Joan had never seen him appear like this, and she shrank as from another and forbidding side of the man. Pierce and Smith acted naturally, ate with relish, and talked about the gold diggings. Cleve, however, was not as usual, and Joan could not quite make out what constituted the dissimilarity. She hurried through her own supper and back to her room. Already it was dark outside. Joan lay down to listen and wait. It seemed long, but probably it was not long before she heard the men go outside and the low thump of their footsteps as they went away. Then came the rattle and bang of Bate Wood's attack on the pans and pots. Bate liked to cook, but he hated to clean up afterward. By and by he settled down outside for his evening smoke and there was absolute quiet. Then Joan rose to stand at the window. She could see the dark mass of rock overhanging the cabin, the bluff beyond, and the stars. For the rest was all gloom. She did not have to wait long. A soft step, almost indistinguishable, made her pulse beat quicker. She put her face out of the window, and on the instant a dark form seemed to loom up to meet her out of the shadow. She could not recognize that shape, yet she knew it belonged to Cleve. Joan, he whispered. Jim, she replied, just as low and gladly. He moved closer, so that the hand she had gropingly put out touched him, then seemed naturally to slip along to his shoulder, round his neck. And his face grew clearer in the shadow. His lips met hers, and Joan closed her eyes to that kiss. What hope! What strength for him and for her, now, in that meeting of lips. "'Oh, Jim, I'm so glad to have you near, to touch you,' she whispered. "'Do you still love me?' he whispered back tensely. "'Still? More, more. Say it, then.' "'Jim, I love you.' And their lips met again and clung, and it was he who drew back first. "'Dearest, why didn't you let me make a break and get away with you?' before we came to this camp. Oh, Jim, I told you I was afraid. We'd have been caught, and Golden will never have half the chance here. Kells means to keep you closely guarded. I heard the order. He's different now. He's grown crafty and hard. 
and the miners of this Alder Creek. Why, I'm more afraid to trust them than men like Wood or Pierce. They've gone clean crazy, gold mad. If you shouted for your life, they wouldn't hear you. And if you could make them hear, they wouldn't believe. This camp has sprung up in a night. It's not like any place I've ever heard of. It's not human. It's so strange, so... Oh, I don't know what to say. I think I mean that men in a great gold strike become like coyotes at a carcass. You've seen that. No relation at all. I'm frightened too, Jim. I wish I had the courage to run when we were back in Cabin Gulch. But don't ever give up. Not for a second. We can get away. We must plan and wait. Find out where we are, how far from Hoadley, what we must expect, whether it's safe to approach anyone in this camp. Safe? I guess not, after today, he whispered grimly. Why, what happened? she asked quickly. Joan, have you guessed yet why Kells sent you down into the camp alone? No. Listen. I went with Kells and Smith and Pierce. They hurried straight to the last nugget. There was a crowd of men in front of the place. Pierce walked straight up to one, a gambler by his clothes. And he said in a loud voice, Here's the man. The gambler looked startled, turned pale, and went for his gun. But Kells shot him. He fell dead without a word. There was a big shout, then silence. Kells stood there with his smoking gun. I never saw the man so cool, so masterful. Then he addressed the crowd. This gambler insulted my daughter. My men here saw him. My name is Blight. I came here to buy up gold claims. And I want to say this. Your Alder Creek has got the gold. But it needs some of your best citizens to run it right, so a girl can be safe on the street. Joan, I tell you, it was a magnificent bluff, went on Jim excitedly, and it worked. Kells walked away amid cheers. He meant to give an impression of character and importance. He succeeded. So far as I could tell, there wasn't a man present who did not show admiration for him. I saw that dead gambler kicked. Jim, breathed Joan, he killed him just for that? Just for that, the bloody devil. But still, what for? Oh, it was cold-blooded murder. No, an even break. Kells made the gambler go for his gun. I'll have to say that for Kells. It doesn't change the thing. I've forgotten what a monster he is. Joan, his motive is plain. This new gold camp has not reached the blood-spilling stage yet. It hadn't, I should say. The news of this killing will fly. It'll focus minds on this claim buyer, Blight. His deed rings true like that of an honest man with a daughter to protect. He'll win sympathy. Then he talks as if he were prosperous. Soon he'll be represented in this changing, growing population as a man of importance. He'll play the card for all he's worth. Meanwhile, secretly, he'll begin to rob the miners. It'll be hard to suspect him. His plot is just like the man. Great. Jim, oughtn't we tell, whispered Joan, trembling. I've thought of that. Somehow I seem to feel guilty. But whom on earth could we tell? We wouldn't dare speak here. Remember, you're a prisoner. I'm supposed to be a bandit, one of the Border Legion. How to get away from here and save our lives. That's what tortures me. Something tells me we'll escape. If only we can plan the right way, Jim. I'll have to be penned here with nothing to do but wait. You must come every night, won't you? For an answer, he kissed her again. Jim, what will you do meanwhile, she asked anxiously. I'm going to work a claim, dig for gold. I told Kell so today, and he was delighted. He said he was afraid his men wouldn't like the working part of his plan. It's hard to dig gold, easy to steal it. But I'll dig a hole as big as a hill. Wouldn't it be funny if I struck it rich? Jim, you're getting the fever. Joan, if I did happen to run into a gold pocket, there's lots of them found. Would you marry me? The tenderness, the timidity, and the yearning in Cleve's voice 
told Joan as never before how he had hoped and feared and despaired. She patted his cheek with her hand, and in the darkness, with her heart swelling, to make up for what she had done to him, she felt a boldness and a recklessness, sweet, tumultuous, irresistible. "'Jim, I'll marry you, whether you strike gold or not,' she whispered. And there was another blind, sweet moment. Then Cleve tore himself away, and Joan leaned at the window, watching the shadow, with tears in her eyes and an ache in her breast. From that day Joan lived a life of seclusion in the small room. Kells wanted it so, and Joan thought best for the time being not to take advantage of Batewood's duplicity. Her meals were brought to her by Wood, who was supposed to unlock and lock her door, but Wood never turned the key in that padlock. Prisoner though Joan was, the days and nights sped swiftly. Kells was always up till late in the night and slept half of the next morning. It was his wont to see Joan every day about noon. He had a care for his appearance. When he came in, he was dark, forbidding, weary, and cold. Manifestly, he came to her to get rid of the imponderable burden of the present. He left it behind him. He never spoke a word of Alder Creek, of gold, of the Border Legion. Always he began by inquiring for her welfare, by asking what he could do for her, what he could bring her. Joan had an abhorrence of Kells in his absence that she never felt when he was with her, and the reason must have been that she thought of him, remembered him as the bandit, and saw him as another and growing character. Always mindful of her influence, she was as companionable, as sympathetic, as cheerful, and as sweet as it was possible for her to be. Slowly he would warm and change under her charm, and the grim gloom, the dark strain, would pass from him. When that left, he was indeed another person. Frankly, he told Joan, that the glimpse of real love she had simulated back there in Cabin Gulch was seldom out of his mind. No woman had ever kissed him like she had. That kiss had transfigured him. It haunted him. If he could not win kisses like that from Joan's lips, of her own free will, then he wanted none. No other woman's lips would ever touch his. And he begged Joan, in the terrible earnestness of a stern and hungering outcast, for her love. And Joan could only sadly shake her head and tell him she was sorry for him, that the more she really believed he loved her, the surer she was that he would give her up. Then, always, he passionately refused. He must have her to keep, to look at as his treasure, to dream over, and hope against hope that she would love him some day. Women sometimes learn to love their captors, he said, and if she only learned then he would take her away to Australia, to distant lands. But most of all, he begged her to show him again what it meant to be loved by a good woman. And Joan, who knew that her power now lay in her unattainableness, feigned a wavering reluctance, when in truth any surrender was impossible. He left her with a spirit that her presence gave him, in a kind of trance, radiant, yet with mocking smile as if he foresaw the overthrow of his soul through her, and in the light of that his waning power over his legion was as nothing. In the afternoon he went down into the camp to strengthen the associations he had made, to buy claims and to gamble. Upon his return, Joan, peeping through a crack between the boards, could always tell whether he had been gambling, whether he had won or lost. Most of the evenings he remained in his cabin, which, after dark, became a place of mysterious and stealthy action. The members of his legion visited him, sometimes alone, never more than two together. Joan could hear them slipping in at the hidden aperture in the back of the cabin. She could hear the low voices, but seldom what was said. She could hear these night prowlers as they departed. Afterward, Kells would have the lights lit, and then Joan could see into the cabin. Was that dark? 
haggard man, Kells. She saw him take little buckskin sacks full of gold dust and hide them under the floor. Then he would pace the room in his old familiar manner like a caged tiger. Later his mood usually changed with the advent of Wood and Pierce and Smith and Cleve, who took turns at guard and going down into camp. Then Kells would join them in a friendly game for small stakes. Gambler though he was, he refused to allow any game there that might lead to heavy wagering. From the talk sometimes Joan learned that he played for exceedingly large stakes with gamblers and prosperous miners, usually with the same result, a loss. Sometimes he won, however, and then he would crow over Pierce and Smith and delight in telling them how cunningly he had played. Jim Cleve had his bed up under the bulge of bluff, in a sheltered nook. Kells had appeared to like this idea, for some reason, relative to his scout system, which he did not explain. And Cleve was happy about it, because this arrangement left him absolutely free to have his nightly rendezvous with Joan at her window, sometime between dark and midnight. Her bed was right under the window. If awake, she could rest on her knees and look out, and if she was asleep, he could thrust a slender stick between the boards to awaken her. But the fact was that Joan lived for these stolen meetings, and unless he could not come until very late, she waited wide-eyed and listening for him. Then, besides, as long as Kells was stirring in the cabin, she spent her time spying upon him. Jim Cleve had gone to an unfrequented part of the gulch for no particular reason, and here he had located his claim. The very first day he struck gold, and Kells, more for advertisement than for any other motive, had his men stake out a number of claims near Cleves and bought them. Then they had a little field of their own. All found the rich pay dirt, but it was Cleve to whom the goddess of fortune turned her bright face. As he had been lucky at cards, so he was lucky at digging. His claim paid big returns. Kells spread the news, and that part of the gulch saw a rush of miners. Every night Joan had her whispered hour with Cleve, and each succeeding one was sweeter. Jim had become a victim of the gold fever, but having Joan to steady him, he did not lose his head. If he gambled, it was to help out with his part. He was generous to his comrades. He pretended to drink, but did not drink at all. Jim seemed to regard his good fortune as Joan's also. He believed if he struck it rich, he could buy his sweetheart's freedom. He claimed that Kells was drunk for gold to gamble away. Joan let Jim talk, but she coaxed him and persuaded him to follow a certain line of behavior she planned for him. She thought for him, she influenced him to hide the greater part of his gold dust and let it be known that he wore no gold belt. She had a growing fear that Jim's success was likely to develop a temper in him, inimical to the cool, waiting, tolerant policy needed to outwit Kells in the end. It seemed the more gold Jim acquired, the more passionate he became, the more he importuned Joan, the more he hated Kells. Gold had gotten into his blood, and it was Joan's task to keep him sane. Naturally, she gained more by yielding herself to Jim's caresses than by any direct advice or admonishment. It was her love that held Jim in check. One night, the instant their hands met, Joan knew that Jim was greatly excited or perturbed. Joan, he whispered thrillingly, with his lips at her ear, I've made myself solid with Kells. Oh, the luck of it. Tell me, whispered Joan, and she leaned against those lips. It was early tonight at the Nugget. I dropped in as usual. Kells was playing faro again with that gambler they call Flash. He's won a lot of Kells's gold, a crooked gambler. I looked on, and some of the gang were there, Pierce, Blicky, Handy Oliver, and, of course, Golden, but all separated. Kells was losing and sore, but he was game. All at once he caught Flash in a crooked trick and he yelled in a rage. 
He sure had the gang and everybody else looking. I expected, and so did all the gang, to see Kells pull his gun. But strange how gambling affects him. He only cursed Flash, called him right. You know that's about as bad as death to a professional gambler in a place like Alder Creek. Flash threw a derringer on Kells. He had it up his sleeve. He meant to kill Kells, and Kells had no chance. But Flash, having the drop, took time to talk, to make his bluff go strong with the crowd. And that's where he made a mistake. I jumped and knocked the gun out of his hand. It went off, burned my wrist. Then I slugged Mr. Flash good. He didn't get up. Kells called the crowd around and, showing the cards as they lay, coolly proved that Flash was what everybody suspected. Then Kells said to me, I'll never forget how he looked. Youngster, he meant to do for me. I never thought of my gun. You see, I'll kill him the next time we meet. I've owed my life to men more than once. I never forget. You stood pat with me before, and now you're ace high. Was it fair of you? asked Joan. Yes. Flash is a crooked gambler. I'd rather be a bandit. Besides, all's fair in love and I was thinking of you when I saved Kells. Flash will be looking for you, said Joan, fearfully. Likely, and if he finds me, he wants to be quick. But Kells will drive him out of camp or kill him. I tell you Kells is the biggest man in Alder Creek. There's talk of office, a mayor, and all that. And if the miners can forget gold long enough, they'll elect Kells. But the riffraff, these bloodsuckers who live off the miners, They'd rather not have any office in Alder Creek. And upon another night, Cleve, in serious and somber mood, talked about the Border Legion and its mysterious workings. The name had found prominence. No one knew how, and Alder Creek knew no more peaceful sleep. The Legion was supposed to consist of a strange secret band of unknown bandits and road agents, drawing its members from all that wild and trackless region called the border. Rumor gave it a leader of cunning and ruthless nature. It operated all over the country at the same time, and must have been composed of numerous smaller bands, impossible to detect, because its victims never lived to tell how or by whom they had been robbed. This legion worked slowly and in the dark. It did not bother to rob for little gain. It had strange and unerring information of large quantities of gold dust. Two prospectors going out on the Bannock Road, packing fifty pounds of gold, were found shot to pieces. A miner named Black, who would not trust his gold to the stage express, and who left Alder Creek against advice, were never seen or heard of again. Four other miners of the camp, known to carry considerable gold, were robbed and killed at night on their way to their cabins, and another was found dead in his bed. Robbers had crept to his tent, slashed the canvas, murdered him while he slept, and made off with his belt of gold. An evil day of blood had fallen upon Alder Creek. There were terrible and implacable men in the midst of the miners, by day at honest toil, learning who had gold, and murdering by night. The camp had never been united, but this dread fact disrupted any possible unity. Every man, or every little group of men, distrusted the other, watched and spied, and laid awake at night. But the robberies continued, one every few days, and each one left no trace, for dead men could not talk. Thus was ushered in at Alder Creek a regime of wildness that had no parallel in the earlier days of forty-nine and fifty-one. Men frenzied by the possession of gold or greed, for it responded to the wildness of that time, and took their cue from this deadly and mysterious border legion. The gold lust created its own blood lust. Daily the population of Alder Creek grew in the new gold seekers, and its dark records kept pace. With distrust came suspicion, and with suspicion came fear, and with fear came hate. And these, in already distorted minds, 
inflamed the hell. So that the most primitive passions of mankind found outlet and held sway. The operations of the Border Legion were lost in deeds done in the gambling dens, in the saloons, and on the street in broad day. Men fought for no other reason than that the incentive was in the charge there. Men were shot at gaming tables, and the game went on. Men were killed in the dance halls, dragged out, marking a line of blood on the rude floor, and the dance went on. Still the pursuit of gold went on, more frenzied than ever, and still the greater and richer claims were struck. The price of gold soared, and the commodities of life were almost beyond the dreams of avarice. It was a tune in which the worst of men's natures stalked forth, hydra-headed and death, roaring for gold, spitting fire, and shedding blood. It was a time when gold and fire and blood were one. It was a tune when a horde of men from every class and nation, of all ages and characters, met on a field where motives and ambitions and faiths and traits merged into one mad instinct of gain. It was worse than the time of the medieval crimes of religion. It made war seem a brave and honorable thing. It robbed manhood of that splendid and noble trait, always seen in shipwrecked men or those hopelessly lost in the barren north. The divine will not retrograde to the savage. It was a time, for all it enriched the world with yellow treasure, when might was right, when men were hopeless, when death stalked rampant. The sun rose gold and it set red. It was the hour of gold. One afternoon, late, while Joan was half dreaming, half dozing, the hours away, she was thoroughly aroused by the tramp of boots and loud voices of excited men. Joan slipped to the peephole in the partition. Batewood had raised a warning hand to Kells, who stood up facing the door. Red Pierce came bursting in, wild-eyed and violent. Joan imagined he was about to cry out that Kells had been betrayed. "'Kells, have you heard?' he panted. Not so loud, you, replied Kells coolly. My name's Blight. Who's with you? Only Jesse and some of the gang. I couldn't steer them away. But there's nothing to fear. What's happened? What haven't I heard? The camp's gone plumb raving crazy. Jim Cleve found the biggest nugget ever dug in Idaho. Thirty pounds. Kells seemed suddenly to inflame, to blaze with white passion. Good for Jimmy, yelled ringingly. He could scarcely have been more elated if he had made the strike himself. Jesse Smith came stamping in, with a crowd elbowing their way behind him. Joan had a start of the old panic at sight of Golden, for once the giant was not slow nor indifferent. His big eyes glared. He brought back to Joan the sickening sense of the brute strength of his massive presence. Some of his cronies were with him. For the rest, there were Blicky and Handy Oliver and Chick Williams. The whole group bore resemblance to a pack of wolves about to leap upon its prey. Yet in each man, excepting Golden, there was that striking aspect of exultation. "'Where's Jim?' demanded Kells. "'He's coming along,' replied Pierce. "'He's sure been running a gauntlet. His strike stopped work in the diggings. What do you think of that, Kells? The news spread like smoke before wind. Every last miner in camp has just got to see that lump of gold. Maybe I don't want to see it, exclaimed Kells. A thirty-pounder. I heard of one once, sixty pounds, but I never saw it. You can't believe till you see. Jim's coming up the road now, said one of the men near the door. That crowd hangs on, but I reckon he's shaking them. What will Cleve do with this nugget? Golden's big voice, so powerful yet feelingless, caused a momentary silence. The expression of many faces changed. Kells looked startled, then annoyed. Why, Golden, that's not my affair nor yours, replied Kells. Cleve dug it, and it belongs to him. Dug or stole, it's all the same, responded Golden. Kells threw up his hands 
as if it were useless and impossible to reason with this man. Then the crowd surged round the door with shuffling boots and hoarse mingled greetings to Cleve, who presently came plunging in out of the melee. His face wore a flash of radiance. His eyes were like diamonds. Joan thrilled and thrilled at sight of him. He was beautiful, yet there was about him a more striking wildness. He carried a gun in one hand and in the other an object wrapped in his scarf. He flung this upon the table in front of Kells. It made a heavy, solid thump. The ends of the scarf flew aside, and there lay a magnificent nugget of gold, black and rusty in parts, but with a dull yellow glitter in others. Boss, what do you bet against that? cried Cleve, with exulting laugh. He was like a boy. Kells reached for the nugget, as if it were not an actual object, and when his hands closed on it, he fondled it and weighed it and dug his nails into it and tasted it. My God, he ejaculated in wandering ecstasy. Then this and the excitement and the obsession all changed into sincere gladness. Jim, you're born lucky. You, the youngster born unlucky in love. Why, you could buy any woman with this. Could I? Find me one, responded Cleve, with swift boldness. Kells laughed. I don't know any worth so much. What'll I do with it? queried Cleve. Why, you fool, youngster, has it turned your head, too? What'd you do with the rest of your dust? You've certainly been striking it rich. I spent it, lost it, lent it, gave some away, and saved a little. Probably you'll do the same with this. You're a good fellow, Jim. But this nugget means a lot of money, between six and seven thousand dollars. You won't need advice on how to spend it, even if it was a million. Tell me, Jim, how'd you strike it? Funny about that, replied Cleve. Things were poor for several days. Dug off branches into my claim. One grew to be a deep hole in gravel, hard to dig. My claim was once the bed of a stream, full of rocks that the water had rolled down once. This hole sort of haunted me. I'd leave it. When my back got so sore I couldn't bend. But always I returned. I'd say there wasn't a darn grain of gold in that gravel. Then, like a fool, I'd go back and dig for all I was worth. No chance of finding blue dirt down there. But I kept on. And today, when my pick hit what felt like a soft rock, I looked and saw the gleam of gold. You ought to have seen me claw out that nugget. I whooped and brought everybody around. The rest was a parade. Now I'm embarrassed by riches. What to do with it? Well, go back to Montana and make that fool girl sick, suggested one of the men who had heard Jim's fictitious story of himself. Dug or stole is all the same, boom, the imperturbable Golden. Kells turned white with rage, and Cleve swept a swift and shrewd glance at the giant. Sure, that's my idea, declared Cleve. I'll divide it as we planned. You'll do nothing of the kind, retorted Kells. You dug for that gold, and it's yours. Well, boss, then say a quarter share to you and the same to me, and divide the rest among the gang. No, exclaimed Kells violently. Joan imagined that he was actuated as much by justice to Cleve as opposition to Golden. Jim Cleve, you're a square pard if I've ever seen one, declared Pierce admiringly, and I'm here to say I wouldn't have a share of your nugget. Nor me, spoke up Jesse Smith. I pass too, said Chick Williams. Jim, if I was dying for a drink, I wouldn't stand for that deal, added Blicky, with a fine scorn. These men and others who spoke or signified their refusal attested to the living truth that there was honor even among robbers. But there was not the slightest suggestion of change in Golden's attitude or those back of him. Share and share alike for me, he muttered, grimly, with those great eyes upon the nugget. Kells, with an agile bound, reached the table and pounded it with his fist, confronting the giant. So you say, 
he hissed in dark passion. You've gone too far, Golden. Here's where I call you. You don't get a gram of that gold nugget. Jim worked like a dog. If he digs up a million, I'll see he gets it all. Maybe you loafers haven't a hunch what Jim's done for you. He's helped out our big deal more than you or I. His honest work has made it easy for me to look honest. He's supposed to be engaged to marry my daughter. That, more than anything, was a blind. It made my stand, and I tell you that stand is high in this camp. Go down there and swear blight is Jack Kells. See what you get, that's all. I'm dealing the cards in this game. Kells did not cow golden for it was likely the giant lacked the feeling of fear, but he overruled him by sheer strength of spirit. Golden backed away stolidly, apparently dazed by his own movements. Then he plunged out the door, and the ruffians, who had given silent but sure expression to their loyalty, tramped after him. "'Reckon that starts to split,' declared Red Pierce. "'Suppose you'd been in Jim's place,' flashed Kells. Jack I ain't saying a word. You was square. I'd want you to do the same by me. But fetching that girl into the deal. Kell's passionate and menacing gesture shut Pierce's lips. He lifted a hand, resignedly, and went out. Jim, said Kells earnestly, take my hunch. Hide your nugget. Don't send it out with the stage to Bannock. It'll never get there. And change the place where you sleep. Thanks, replied Cleve, brightly. I'll hide my nugget, all right, and I'll take care of myself. Later that night, Joan waited at her window for Jim. It was so quiet that she could hear the faint murmur of the shallow creek. The sky was dusky blue, the stars were white, the night breeze sweet and cool. Her first flush of elation for Jim having passed, she experienced a sinking of courage. Were they not in peril enough without Jim finding a fortune? How dark and significant had been Kells's hint. There was something splendid in the bandit. Never had Joan felt so grateful to him. He was a villain, yet he was a man. What hatred he showed for Golden. These rivals would surely meet in a terrible conflict for power for gold. And for her, she added involuntarily, with a deep inward shudder. Once the thought had flashed through her mind, it seemed like a word of revelation. Then she started as a dark form rose out of the shadow under her, and a hand clasped hers. Jim! And she lifted her face. Joan! Joan! I'm rich! Rich! He babbled wildly. Shh! whispered Joan softly in his ear. Be careful. You're wild tonight. I saw you come in with the nugget. I heard you. Oh, you lucky Jim! I'll tell you what to do with it. Darling, it's all yours. You'll marry me now. Sir, do you take me for a fortune hunter? I marry you for your gold? Never. Joan, I promised, she said. I won't go away now. I'll work my claim, he began excitedly. And he went on so rapidly that Joan could not keep track of his words. He was not so cautious as formerly. She remonstrated with him all to no purpose. Not only was he carried away by possession of the gold and assured of more, but he had become masterful, obstinate, and illogical. He was indeed hopeless tonight. The gold had gotten into his blood. Joan grew afraid he would betray their secret and realized there had come still greater need for a woman's wit. So she resorted to a never-failing means of silencing him of controlling him, her lips on his. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of the Border Legion by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For several nights these stolen interviews were apparently the safer because of Joan's tender blinding of her lover. But it seemed that in Jim's condition of mind this yielding of her lips 
and her whispers of love had really been a mistake. Not only had she made the situation perilously sweet for herself, but in Jim's case she had added the spark to the powder. She realized her blunder when it was too late, and the fact that she did not regret it very much, and seemed to have lost herself in a defiant, reckless spell, warned her again that she, too, was answering to the wildness of the time and place. Joan's intelligence had broadened wonderfully in this period of her life, just as all her feelings had quickened. If gold had developed and intensified and liberated the worst passions of men, so the spirit of that atmosphere had its baneful effect upon her. Joan deplored this, yet she had the keenness to understand that it was nature fitting her to survive. Back upon her fell the weight of suspense. What would happen next? Here in Alder Creek there did not at present appear to be the same peril which had menaced her before. But she would suffer, through fatality, to cleave or kells. And these two slept that night under a shadow that held death, and by day they walked on a thin crust over a volcano. Joan grew more and more fearful of the disclosures made when Kells met his men nightly in the cabin. She feared to hear, but she must hear, even if she had not felt it necessary to keep informed of events. The fascination of the game would have impelled her to listen, and gradually the suspense she suffered augmented into a magnified, though vague, assurance of catastrophe, of impending doom. She could not shake off the gloomy presentiment. Something terrible was going to happen. An experience begun as tragically as hers could only end in a final and annihilating stroke. Yet hope was unquenchable, and with her fear kept pace a driving and relentless spirit. One night at the end of a week of these interviews, when Joan attempted to resist Jim, to plead with him, lest in his growing boldness he betray them, she found him a madman. I'll pull you right out of this window, he said, roughly, and then with his hot face pressed against hers, tried to accomplish the thing he threatened. Go on, pull me to pieces, replied Joan, in despair and pain. I'd be better off dead, and you hurt me so. "'Hurt you?' he whispered hoarsely, as if he had never dreamed of such possibility. And then suddenly he was remorseful. He begged her to forgive him. His voice was broken, husky, pleading. His remorse, like every feeling of his these days, was exaggerated, wild, with that raw tinge of gold blood in it. He made so much noise that Joan, more fearful than ever of discovery, quieted him with difficulty. "'Does Kells see you often these days?' asked Jim suddenly. Joan had dreaded this question, which she had known would inevitably come. She wanted to lie. She knew she ought to lie, but it was impossible. "'Every day,' she whispered. "'Please, Jim, never mind that. Kells is good. He's all right to me. And you and I have so little time together.' Good, exclaimed Cleve. Joan felt the leap of his body under her touch. Why, if I'd tell you what he sends that gang to do, you, you'd kill him in his sleep. Tell me, replied Joan. She had a morbid, irresistible desire to learn. No, and what does Kells do when he sees you every day? He talks. What about? Oh, everything, except about what holds him here. He talks to me to forget himself. Does he make love to you? Joan maintained silence. What would she do with his changed and hopeless Jim Cleve? Tell me. Jim's hands gripped her with a force that made her wince, and now she grew as afraid of him as she had been for him, but she had spirit enough to grow angry also. Certainly he does. Jim Cleve echoed her first word, and then, through grinding teeth, he cursed. I'm going to stop it, he panted, and his eyes looked big and dark and wild in the starlight. 
You can't. I belong to Kells. You at least ought to have sense enough to see that. Belong to him? For God's sakes, by what right? By the right of possession. Might is right here on the border. Haven't you told me that a hundred times? Don't you hold your claim, your gold, by the right of your strength? It's the law of this border. To be sure, Kells stole me. But just now I belong to him, and lately I see his consideration, his kindness in the light of what he could do if he held to the border law. And of all the men I've met out here, Kells is the least wild with this gold fever. He sends his men out to do murder for gold. He sells his soul to gamble for gold. But just the same, he's more of a man than... Joan, he interrupted piercingly, you love this bandit? You're a fool, burst out Joan. I guess I am, he replied in terrible, slow earnestness. He raised himself and appeared to loom over her and released his hold. But Joan fearfully retained her clasp on his arm, and when he surged to get away, she was hard put to it to hold him. Jim, where are you going? He stood there a moment, a dark form against the night shadow, like an outline of a man cut from black stone. I'll just step around there. Oh, for what, whispered Joan. I'm going to kill Kells. Joan got both arms round his neck, and with her head held against him, she held him tightly, trying, praying, to think how to meet this long-dreaded moment. After all, what was the use to try? This was the hour of gold. Sacrifice, hope, courage, nobility, fidelity. These had no place here now. Men were the embodiment of passion, ferocity. They breathed only possession, and the thing in the balance was death. Women were creatures to hunger and fight for, but womanhood was nothing. Joan knew all this with a desperate, hardening certainty, and almost she gave in. Strangely, thought of Golden flashed up to make her again strong. Then she raised her face and began the old pleading with Jim, but different this time, when it seemed that absolutely all was at stake. She begged him, she importuned him to listen to reason, to be guided by her, to fight the wildness that had obsessed him, to make sure that she would not be left alone. All in vain. He swore he would kill Kells and any other bandit who stood in the way of his leading her free out of that cabin. He was wild to fight. He might never have felt fear of these robbers. He would not listen to any possibility of defeat for himself or the possibility that in the event of Kells's death she would be worse off. He laughed at her strange, morbid fears of Golden. He was immovable. Jim, Jim, you'll break my heart, she whispered wailingly. Oh, what can I do? Then Joan released her clasp and gave up in utter defeat. Cleve was silent. He did not seem to hear the shuddering little sobs that shook her. Suddenly, he bent close to her. There's one thing you can do. If you do it, I won't kill Kells. I'll obey your every word. What is it? Tell me. Marry me, he whispered, and his voice trembled. Marry you, exclaimed Joan. She was confounded. She began to fear Jim was out of his head. I mean it. Marry me. Oh, Joan, will you? Will you? It'll make the difference. That'll steady me. Don't you want to? Jim might be the happiest girl in the world if, if only I could marry you, she breathed passionately. But will you? Will you? Say yes. Say yes. Yes, replied Joan in her desperation. I hope that pleases you. But what on earth is the use to talk about it now? Cleve seemed to expand, to grow taller, to thrill under her nervous hands. And then he kissed her differently. She sensed a shyness, a happiness, a something hitherto foreign to his attitude. It was spiritual, and somehow she received an uplift of hope. Listen, he whispered, there's a preacher down in the camp. 
I've seen him, talked with him. He's trying to do good in that hell down there. I know I can trust him. I'll confide in him enough. I'll fetch him up here tomorrow night about this time. Oh, I'll be careful, very careful. And he can marry us right here by the window. Joan, will you do it? Somehow, whatever threatens you or me, that'll be my salvation. I've suffered so. It's been burned in my heart that you would never marry me. Yet you say you love me. Prove it, my wife. Now, girl, a word will make a man of me. Yes. And with the word, she put her lips to his with all her heart in them. She felt him tremble. Yet almost instantly, he put her from him. Look for me tomorrow about this time, he whispered. Keep your nerve. Good night. That night Joan dreamed strange, weird, unremembered dreams. The next day passed like a slow, unreal age. She ate little of what was brought to her. For the first time she denied Kell's admittance, and she only vaguely sensed his solicitations. She had no ear for the murmur of voices in Kells's room. Even the loud and angry notes of a quarrel between Kells and his men did not distract her. At sunset, she leaned out of the little window, and only then, with the gold fading on the peaks and the shadow gathering under the bluff, did she awaken to reality. A broken mass of white cloud caught the glory of the sinking sun. She had never seen a golden radiance like that. It faded and dulled, but a warm glow remained. At twilight and then at dusk, this glow lingered. Then night fell. Joan was exceedingly sensitive to the sensations of light and shadow, of sounds and silence, of dread and hope, of sadness and joy. That pale, ruddy glow lingered over the bold heave of the range in the west. It was like a fire that would not go out, that would live tomorrow and burn golden. The sky shone with deep, rich blue color, fired with a thousand stars, radiant, speaking, hopeful. And there was a white track across the heavens. The mountains flung down their shadows, impenetrable like the gloomy minds of men and everywhere under the bluffs and slopes, in the hollows and ravines, lay an enveloping blackness, hiding its depth and secret and mystery. Joan listened. Was there sound or silence? A faint and indescribable low roar, so low that it might have been real or false, came on the soft night breeze. It was the roar of the camp down there, the strife, the agony the wild life in ceaseless action, the strange voice of gold, roaring, greed, and battle and death over the souls of men. But above that, presently, rose the murmur of the creek, a hushed and dreamy flow of water over stones. It was hurrying to get by this horde of wild men, for it must bear the taint of gold and blood. Would it purge itself and clarify in the valleys below, on its way to the sea? There was, in its murmur, an imperishable and deathless note of nature, of time, and this was only a fleeting day of men and gold. Only by straining her ears could Joan hear these sounds, and when she ceased that, she seemed to be weighed upon and claimed by silence. It was not a silence like that of Lost Canyon, but a silence of solitude where her soul stood alone. She was there on earth, yet no one could hear her mortal cry. The thunder of avalanches or the boom of the sea might have lessened her sense of utter loneliness. And that silence fitted the darkness, and both were apostles of dread. They spoke to her. She breathed dread on that silent air and it filled her breast. There was nothing stable in the night shadows. The ravine seemed to send forth stealthy, noiseless shapes, specter and human, man and phantom, each on the other's trail. If Jim would only come and let her see that he was safe for the hour. A hundred times she imagined 
she saw him looming darker than the shadows. She had only to see him now, to feel his hand, and dread might be lost. Love was something beyond the grasp of mind. Love had confounded Jim Cleve. It had brought up kindness and honor from the black depths of a bandit's heart. It had transformed her from a girl into a woman. Surely, with all its greatness, it could not be lost. Surely, in the end, it must triumph over evil. Joan found that hope was fluctuating, but eternal. It took no stock of intelligence. It was a matter of feeling. And when she gave rein to it for a moment, suddenly it plunged her in the sadness. To hope was to think. Poor Jim. It was his fool's paradise. Just to let her be his wife. That was the apex of his dream. Joan divined that he might yield to her wisdom. He might become a man, but his agony would be greater. Still, he had been so intense, so strange, so different, that she could not but feel joy in his joy. Then, at a soft footfall, a rustle, and a moving shadow, Joan's mingled emotions merged into a poignant sense of the pain and suspense and tenderness of the actual moment. Joan, Joan, came the soft whisper. She answered, and there was a catch in her breath. The moving shadow split into two shadows that stole closer, loomed before her. She could not tell which belonged to Jim till he touched her. His touch was potent. It seemed to electrify her. Dearest, we're here. This is the parson, said Jim, like a happy boy. I... Shh, whispered Joan, not so loud. Listen. Kells was holding a rendezvous with members of his legion. Joan even recognized his hard and somber tone, and the sharp voice of Red Pierce, and the draw of Handy Oliver. All right, I'll be quiet, responded Cleve cautiously. Joan, you're to answer a few questions. Then a soft hand touched Joan, and a voice differently keyed from any she had heard on the border addressed her. What is your name? asked the preacher. Joan told him. Can you tell me anything about yourself? This young man is, is almost violent. I'm not sure. Still, I want to. I can't tell much, replied Joan hurriedly. I'm an honest girl. I'm free to, to marry him. I, I love him. Oh, I want to help him. We are in trouble here. I daren't say how. Are you over eighteen? Yes, sir. Do your parents object to this young man? I have no parents, and my uncle, with whom I have lived before I was brought to this awful place, he loves Jim. He always wanted me to marry him. Then take his hand. Joan felt the strong clasp of Jim's fingers, and that was all which seemed real at the moment. It seemed so dark and shadowy round these two black forms in front of her window. She heard a mournful wail of a lone wolf, and it intensified the weird dream that bound her. She heard her shaking, whispered voice, repeating the preacher's words. She caught a phrase of low, murmured prayer. Then one dark form moved silently away. She was alone with Jim. Dearest Joan, he whispered, it's over, it's done. Kiss me. She lifted her lips, and Jim seemed to kiss her more sweetly with less violence. Oh, Joan, that you'd really have me. I can't believe it. Your husband. That word dispelled the dream and the pain which had held Joan leaving only the tenderness magnified now a hundredfold. At that instant when she was locked in Cleve's arms, when the silence was so beautiful and full, she heard the heavy pound of a gun butt upon the table in Kells's room. Where is Cleve? That was the voice of Kells, stern, demanding. Joan felt a start, a tremor run over Jim. Then he stiffened. I can't locate him, replied Red Pierce. It was the same last night and the one before. Cleve's just disappeared these nights about this time. Some woman's got him. He goes to bed. Can't you find where he sleeps? No. This job got to go through, and he's got to do it. Bah, taunted Pierce. 
Golden swears you can't make Cleve do a job, and so do I. Go out and yell for Cleve. Damn you all, I'll show you. Then Joan heard the tramp of heavy boots, then a softer tramp on the ground outside the cabin. Joan waited, holding her breath. She felt Jim's beating heart. He stood like a post. He, like Joan, was listening, as if for a trumpet of doom. Hello, Jim, rang out Pierce's stentorian call. It murdered the silence. It boomed under the bluff and clapped an echo and wound away mockingly. It seemed to have shrieked to the whole wild borderland, the breaking point of the bandit's power. So momentous was the call that Jim Cleve seemed to forget Joan, and she let him go without a word. Indeed, he was gone before she realized it, and his dark form dissolved in the shadows. Joan waited, listened, with abated breathing. On this side of the cabin there was absolute silence. She believed that Jim would slip around under the cover of night and return by the road from camp. Then what would he do? The question seemed to puzzle her. Joan leaned there at her window for moments, greatly differing from those vaguely happy ones just past. She had sustained a shock that had left her benumbed with a dull pain. What a rude, raw break the voice of Kells had made in her brief forgetfulness. She was returning now to reality. Presently she would peer through the crevice between the boards into the other room, and she shrank from the ordeal. Kells, and whoever was with him, maintained silence. Occasionally she heard the shuffle of a boot and a creak of the loose floorboards. She waited till anxiety and fear compelled her to look. The lamps were burning, the door was wide open. Apparently Kells's rule of secrecy had been abandoned. One glance at Kells was enough to show Joan that he was sick and desperate. Handy Oliver did not wear his usual lazy good humor. Red Pierce sat silent and sullen, a smoking, unheeded pipe in his hand. Jesse Smith was gloomy. The only other present was Bate Wood, and whatever had happened had in no wise affected him. These bandits were all waiting. Presently quick footsteps on the path outside caused them all to look toward the door. That tread was familiar to Joan, and suddenly her mouth was dry, her tongue stiff. What was Jim Cleve coming to meet? How sharp and decided his walk! Then his dark form crossed the bar of light outside the door, and he entered, bold and cool, and with a weariness that must have been simulated. "'Howdy, boys,' he said. Only Kells greeted him in response. The bandit eyed him curiously. The others added suspicion to their glances. "'Did you hear Red's yell?' queried Kells presently. "'I'd have heard that roar if I'd been dead,' replied Cleve bluntly and I didn't like it. I was coming up the road, and I heard Pierce yell. I'll bet every man in camp heard it. How'd you know Pierce yelled for you? I recognized his voice. Cleve's manner recalled to Joan, her first sight of him over in Cabin Gulch. He was not so white or haggard, but his eyes were piercing, and what had once been recklessness now seemed to be boldness. He deliberately studied Pierce. Joan trembled, for she divined what none of these robbers knew, and it was that Pierce was perilously near death. It was there for Joan to read in Jim's dark glance. "'Where you been all these nights?' queried the bandit leader. "'Is that any of your business, when you haven't had need of me?' returned Cleve. "'Yes, it's my business, and I've sent for you. You couldn't be found. I've been here for supper every night.' I don't talk to any men in daylight. You know my hours for meeting, and you've not come. You should have told me. How was I to know? I guess you're right, but where you been? Down in camp, Pharaoh most of the time. Bad luck, too. Red Pierce's coarse face twisted in a scornful sneer. It must have been a lash to Kells. Pierce says you're chasing a woman, retorted the bandit leader. Pierce lies, flashed Cleve, 
His action was swift, and there he stood with a gun thrust hard against Pierce's side. "'Jim, don't kill him!' yelled Kells, rising. Pierce's red face turned white. He stood still as a stone, with his gaze fixed in fascinated fear upon Cleve's gun. A paralyzing surprise appeared to hold the group. "'Can you prove what you said?' asked Cleve, low and hard. Joan knew that if Pierce did have proof which would implicate her, he would never live to tell it. "'Cleve, I don't know nothing,' choked out Pierce. "'I just figured it was a woman.' Cleve slowly lowered the gun and stepped back. Evidently that satisfied him. But Joan had an intuitive feeling that Pierce lied. "'You want to be careful how you talk about me,' said Cleve. Kells purled out a suspended breath and he flung the sweat from his brow. There was about him, perhaps, more than the others, a dark realization of how close the call had been for Pierce. Jim, you're not drunk? No. But you're sore? Sure I'm sore. Pierce put me in bad with you, didn't he? No, you misunderstood me. Red hasn't a thing against you, and neither he nor anybody else could put you in bad with me. All right, maybe I was hasty, but I'm not wasting time these days, replied Cleve. I've no hard feelings. Pierce, do you want to shake hands or hold it against me? He'll shake, of course, said Kells. Pierce extended his hand, but with a bad grace. He was dominated. This affront of Cleve's would rankle in him. Kells, what do you want with me, demanded Cleve. A change passed over Kells, and Joan could not tell just what it was, but somehow it seemed to suggest a weaker man. Jim, you've been a great card for me, began Kells impressively. You've helped my game, and twice you've saved my life. I think a lot of you. If you stand by me now, I swear, I'll return the trick some day. Will you stand by me? Yes, replied Cleve steadily, but he grew pale. What's the trouble? By, it's bad enough, exclaimed Kells, and as he spoke, the shade deepened in his haggard face. Golden has split my legion. He has drawn away more than half my men. They have been drunk and crazy ever since. They've taken things into their own hands. You see the result as well as I. That camp down there is fire and brimstone. Some of that drunken gang has talked. We're none of us safe any more. I see suspicion everywhere. I've urged getting a big stake and then hitting the trail for the border, but not a man sticks to me in that. They all want the free, easy, wild life of this gold camp. So we're anchored till... till... But maybe it's not too late. Pierce, Oliver, Smith, all the best of my legion, profess loyalty to me. If we all pull together, maybe we can win yet but they've threatened to split, too, and it's all on your account. Mine, ejaculated Cleve. Yes, now it's nothing to make you flash your gun. Remember you've said you'd stand by me. Jim, the fact is, all the gang to a man believe you're double-crossing me. In what way? queried Cleve, blanching. They think you're the one who has talked. They blame you for the suspicion that's growing. Well, they're absolutely wrong, declared Cleve, in a ringing voice. I know they are. Mind you, I'm not hinting I distrust you. I don't. I swear by you, but Pierce... So it's Pierce, interrupted Cleve darkly. I thought you said he hadn't tried to put me in bad with you. He hasn't. He simply spoke his convictions. He has a right to them. So have all the men. And to come to the point... They all think you're crooked because you're honest. I don't understand, replied Cleve slowly. Jim, you rode into Cabin Gulch, and you raised some trouble. But you were no bandit. You joined my legion, but you've never become a bandit. Here you've been an honest miner. That suited my plan, and it helped. But it's got so it doesn't suit my men. You work every day hard. You've struck it rich. You're well thought of in Alder Creek. You've never done a dishonest thing. Why, you wouldn't turn a crooked trick in a card game 
for a sack full of gold. This has hurt you with my men. They can't see as I see that you're as square as you are game. They see you're an honest miner. They believe you've got into a click, that you've given us away. I don't blame Pierce or any of my men. This is a time when men's intelligence, if they have any, doesn't operate. Their brains are on fire. They see gold and whiskey and blood. And they feel gold and whiskey and blood, that's all. I'm glad that the gang gives you the benefit of a doubt and a chance to stand by me. A chance? Yes, they've worked out a job for you alone. Will you undertake it? I'll have to, replied Cleve. You certainly will, if you want the gang to justify my faith in you. Once you've pulled off a crooked deal, they'll switch and swear by you. Then we'll get together, all of us, and plan what to do about Golden and his outfit. They'll run our heads, along with their own, right into the noose. What is this, this job? labored Cleve. He was sweating now, and his hair hung damp over his brow. He lost that look which had made him a bold man, and seemed a boy again, weak, driven, bewildered. Kells averted his gaze before speaking again. He hated to force this task upon Cleve. Joan felt, in the throbbing pain of the moment, that if she never had another reason to like this bandit, she would like him for the pity he showed. "'Do you know a miner named Creed?' asked Kells rapidly. "'A husky chap, short, broad, something like golden for shape, only not so big. Fellow with a fierce red beard,' asked Cleve. I never saw him, replied Kells, but Pierce has. How does Cleve's description fit Creed? He's got his man spotted, answered Pierce. All right, that's settled, went on Kells, warming to his subject. This fellow Creed wears a heavy belt of gold. Blicky never makes a mistake. Creed's partner left on yesterday's stage for Bannock. He'll be gone a few days. Creed is a hard worker, one of the hardest. Sometimes he goes to sleep at his supper. He's not the drinking kind. He's slow, thick-headed. The best time for this job will be early in the evening, just as soon as his lights are out. Locate the tent. It stands at the head of a little wash, and there's a bleached pine tree right by the tent. Tomorrow night, as soon as it gets dark, crawl up this wash, be careful, wait till the right time, then finish the job quick. How finish it? asked Cleve hoarsely. Kells was scintillating now, steely, cold, radiant. He had forgotten the man before him in the prospect of the gold. Creed's cot is on the side of the tent opposite the tree. You won't have to go inside. Slit the canvas. It's a rotten old tent. Kill Creed with your knife. Get his belt. Be bold, cautious, swift. That's your job. Now, what do you say? All right, responded Cleve, somberly, and with a heavy tread he left the room. After Jim had gone, Joan still watched and listened. She was in distress over his unfortunate situation, but she had no fear that he meant to carry out Kells's plan. This was a critical time for Jim, and therefore for her. She had no idea what Jim could do. All she thought was what he would not do. Kells gazed triumphantly at Pierce. I told you the youngster would stand by me. I never put him on a job before. Reckon I've figured wrong, boss, replied Pierce. He looks sick to me, but game, said Handy Oliver. Kells is right, Red, and you've been sore-headed over nothing. Maybe, but ain't it good figuring to make Cleve do some kind of job, even if he is on the square. They all acquiesced to this, even Kell slowly nodding his head. Jack, I've thought of another and better job for young Cleve, spoke up Jesse Smith, with his characteristic grin. You all be setting jobs for him now, replied Kells. What's yours? You spoke of planning to get together once more. What's left of us? And there's that bull-headed Golden. You're sure right, returned the leader grimly, and he looked at Smith as if he would welcome any suggestion. I was never afraid to speak my mind, went on Smith. Here he lost his grin, and his coarse mouth grew hard. 
Golden will have to be killed if we're going to last. Wood, what do you say? queried Kells with narrowing eyes. Batewood nodded approvingly, as if he had been asked about his bread. Oliver, what do you say? Well, I'd love to wait and see gold hang. But if you press me, I'll agree to stand pat with the cards Jesse's dealt, replied Handy Oliver. Then Kells turned with a bright gleam upon his face. And you, Pierce? I'd say yes in a minute, if I'd not have to take a hand in that job, replied Pierce, with a hard laugh. Golden won't be so easy to kill. He'll pack a gun full of lead. I'll gamble. If the gang of us cornered him in his cabin, he'd do for most of us before we killed him. Gull sleeps alone. No one knows where, said Handy Oliver, and he can't be surprised. Red's correct. How are we going to kill him? If you gents will listen, you'll find out, rejoined Jesse Smith. That's the job for young Cleve. He can do it. Sure, Golden never was afraid of any man. But something about Cleve bluffed him. I don't know what. Send Cleve out after Golden. He'll call him face to face anywhere and beat him to a gun. Take my word for it. Jesse, that's the grandest idea you've ever had, said Kells softly. His eyes shone. The old power came back to his face. I'll split on Golden. With him once out of the way. Boss, are you going to make that Jim Cleve second job? inquired Pierce curiously. I am, replied Kells, with his jaw corded and stiff. If he pulls that off, you'll never hear a yap from me so long as I live, and I'll eat out of Cleve's hand. Joan could bear to hear no more. She staggered to her bed and fell there, all cramped as if in a cold vice. However Jim might meet the situation, plan for murdering Creed, she knew he would not shirk facing Golden with deadly intent. He hated Golden because she had a horror of him. Would these hours of suspense never end? Must she pass from one torture to another until... Sleep did not come for a long time, and when it did, she suffered with nightmares from which it seemed she could never awaken. The day, when it at last arrived, was no better than the night. It wore on endlessly, and she who listened so intently found it one of the silent days. Only Batewood remained at the cabin. He appeared kinder than usual, but Joan did not want to talk. She ate her meals, passed the hours watching from the window and lying on the bed. Dusk brought Kells and Pierce and Smith, but not Jim Cleve. Handy Oliver and Blicky arrived at supper time. Reckon Jim's appetite is poor, remarked Batewood, reflectively. He ain't been in today. Some of the bandits laughed, but Kells had a twinge if Joan ever saw a man have one. The dark, formidable, stern look was on his face. He alone of the men ate sparingly and after the meal he took to his bent posture and thoughtful pacing. Joan saw the added burden of another crime upon his shoulders. Conversation, which had been desultory, such as any miners or campers might have indulged in, gradually diminished to a word here and there, and finally ceased. Kells always at this hour had a dampening effect upon his followers. More and more he drew aloof from them, yet he never realized that. He might have been alone, but often he glanced out of the door and appeared to listen. Of course he expected Jim Cleve to return. But what did he expect of him? Joan had a blind faith that Jim would be cunning enough to fool Kells and Pierce. So much depended upon it. Some of the bandits uttered an exclamation. Then silently, like a shadow, Jim Cleve entered. Joan's heart leaped and seemed to stand still. Jim could not have looked more terrible if he were really a murderer. He opened his coat, then he flung a black object upon the table and it fell with a soft, heavy, sodden thud. It was a leather belt packed with gold. When Kells saw that, he looked no more at the pale cleave. His claw-like hand swept out for the belt, lifted it, and weighed it. Likewise, the other bandits, with golden sight, 
surged around Kells, forgetting Cleve. Twenty pounds!' exclaimed Kells, with a strange rapture in his voice. "'Let me heft it,' asked Pierce, thrillingly. Joan saw and heard so much, then through a kind of dimness that she could not wipe away, her eyes beheld Jim. What was the awful thing she had interpreted from his face, his mien? Was this a part he was playing to deceive Kells? The slow-gathering might of her horror came with the meaning of that gold belt. Jim had brought back the gold belt of the minor creed. He had, in his passion to remain near her, to save her in the end, kept his word to Kells and done the ghastly deed. Joan reeled and sank back upon the bed, blindly, with darkening sight and mind. End of chapter 15